Hello everyone. Welcome to History Surfer. This is a lecture for my art appreciation class on Mesopotamia. As you can see here, the area we're looking at is where modern day Iraq would be. And ancient Mesopotamia was called that because the word means um, land between two rivers. And here is the two rivers, if we look down here, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Okay, and we're going to concentrate on this area here, which was a, um, it was an association of city-states called Sumer, um, also Sumeria, and we're going to concentrate on the big city of Ur. As you can see, they sit, it sits right close to the mouth of the Persian Gulf, and it was called the Fertile Crescent because in this period, it's incredibly lush. doesn't look anything like it looks today because everyone, when you think of Iraq, as we've seen images on media, it's very dry and arid. Not so in this period. It was very lush and almost tropical-like, like Florida, for those of you who are familiar with our temperature here because we are, I am teaching in Florida. Uh, so let's talk about what happened at Mesopotamia. We consider this one of the earliest examples of civilization because of the invention of writing. Their writing is called cuneiform or cuneiform. I've heard both ways. I learned cuneiform. It's what I tend to say. And it was made with a stylus on a wet clay tablet. Uh, all evidence points to this emergence of this writing style in order to make records for trade. They were trading up and down the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates as well as into the Persian Gulf and as far as Africa. And we have evidence of that in the artifacts found there. The other thing that when we mention water, uh, we have to talk about with the people of Sumer is that they are one of the first people to really actually control water. They were building canals. They had drainage systems in their city. And they were very aware of the power of water as flooding was a problem on these two rivers and torrential floods could cause total devastation in their civilization. So it's, you know, it makes sense that they started to think about how do you control water. When we look at the findings there, uh, for archaeologists, the great finds were around the Temple of Namu, the Great Ziggurat of Ur. The uh, archaeologists focus on this because it's an obvious piece of the landscape there. Ziggurats are platforms. Oops, let me go back. Sorry, I have too many wires sitting here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, platforms that have god houses built on the top of them, which you can see there. The Great Ziggurat of Ur was built by the King Namu, and the only people allowed up on the top were the god, as well as the priests and the king. Today it looks like this. Um, as you can see, it has lost its god house at some point in its history, and it's made of brick. When we look closely at it, we can see that. Uh, the front staircase is ceremonial, and the entire ziggurat is not is not a hollow core, so you don't use this part of the structure that is built around a mound of dirt. It was very well engineered. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it quite clearly here. You see the holes in there. Uh, the engineers of Ur put holes in there so that when that dirt was moist, because it did get moist inside there when they had rain, it contracted, and, or excuse me, it expanded and this allowed the breathing of that soil. And so it's a very clever way to make sure they don't have any structural issues. The person who most famously found the greatest archaeological find at Ur was Sir Leonard Woolley, the archaeologist. He's British. He worked with the British um, Ashmolean Museum, I think he's from, but I also know he was working with 
the University of Pennsylvania. I think he's the British Museum. I take that back. But Woolley was also famously known for being a spy during World War I. And so he's kind of the Indiana Jones, if you will, of the archaeology world. I have always been fascinated by his story. You can see he looked like a serious guy and here he is when he found these were the drainage pipes found under the city. Isn't that cool? That's his wife. And he's like the first person to really dig into this place. Woolley is phenomenally successful here. Found in the King's Graves were things like this tablet which tells stories and we can read cuneiform so we understand what's happening here. As well as this, I want my students to note um, how the king is proportionately much larger and I don't want you to forget we talked about that uh, hierarchic proportion. If it's bigger, it's more important and that's just as easy as I can say it. The King's Grave was phenomenally rich in yielding lots and lots of treasures like this, the tablets and everything, but probably of most interest to people just looking at the collection. It was in the museum in, in Baghdad are the musical instruments. There was a copper lyre uh, with the bull's head on it as well as a, and that's how you spell Lear, by the way, for my students, and that, as well as the gold-headed Lear. If we look at this, it tells us a lot of information about the Mesopotamian people. For instance, you can see here on the front part of this, it's like a harp instrument. Um, I'll show you a side view. You can see it's got strings. Uh, that's ivory, so we know they're trading into Africa, and the gold, of course, would also have come from Africa. Uh, the hair and the beard are from northern, from north of there in the Caucasus Mountains. It's lapis lazuli. The powerful figure of the bull or the ox that pulled the, the uh, plows. A, a very, very symbolically important in their culture as they were farming things like barley. Um, they're agriculturalists, essentially, uh, but just an extremely fertile area. They got a lot of money from, you know, selling their goods. The bull head leer then is one of those phenomenally beautiful objects that come out of the king's grave. We also find lots of statues there. Uh, they have the typical Sumerian look to it. Mesopotamian objects have very big eyes. So we see that they're filled with shells or painted. Uh, the stance is quite frontal, and by the way, these are quite small. They're made of clay. Um, we don't have any life-size work being done here. This is all very small as clay is, you know, has no tensile strength, essentially. You can see the large figure here, the male figure with the beard, and notice the clasped hands and also the kind of railroad track legs. They're very frontal. They're very conservative. They don't change the style of their art much. It doesn't, I mean, I can show you another couple hundred years, this stylization. Stylization means it's a formula that is not deviated from. It continues on, and here we have a figure later. This is a later figure with the beard as well as the clasped hands. It doesn't change. The thing about a lot of the treasures from this region is that with a lot of tension and conflict there, as you can see by this image I have here, uh, there is going to be things lost. And unfortunately, this is a byproduct of, you know, these things. Uh, this is, as you can see, the top of the ziggurat. It's empty. And there's lots of images online if you're interested to see what, you know, was done there. I got some of these from students. You can see here the brickwork. But also notice, you know, this is army, as I had a student point out to me. Um, they're going, they're doing physical training here at the ziggurat. Uh, supposedly, this is going to be open for 
tourists. I did look on uh, TripAdvisor and they were selling tickets. They told you how to find the tickets. I'm not too sure I would go there, but still, just know this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's super important in the history of the ancient world. It's a very you know, telling feature that we still look to this area for the beginning of civilizations. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when things like this happen, some of the artifacts were lost. I read a really interesting article in Art News about how they were working to return uh, the artifacts back to the museum because then um, the museum was totally devastated by what the events that transpired in Iraq. So that's it for today. This is a short lecture, obviously. It's, I usually attach it to either the beginning of Egypt or the end of the prehistoric period. So today it stands on its own. But uh, I hope that this is helpful. And for my students, I will see you in class. Peace out.